Okay. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? So we'll start uh, in the next uh, four minutes, just let some more people come in. Ah, uh, yes. How about now? Can you hear me? Yep, I can see the slides just fine. Uh, yeah, I think it's all good on my end. Just got a few more minutes to wait. Yeah, three more minutes. <laughs> God, I missed dinner today. That's uh, unfortunate, to say the least. You want me to speak? Excuse me? Can you hear me now? Um, is it working? Sorry, I had noise suppression on. Um, okay, so we've got about one more minute to go. So I can just do a little introduction if you want. Um, so we're really lucky to be joined by, I'm going to pronounce your username really wrong. Faithan. Uh, Faithan? Yeah. Faithan, okay. We're really lucky. So Faithan is a professional um, ecologist, would you say? Sea turtle Conservation ecologist? Yeah. Conservationist, yeah. So we're really lucky to be joined today. And uh, he's going to be giving us a guest lecture to the server. So everyone give him lots of love. And please ask your questions at the end in the lectures and conferences channel where he can answer them at the end of the lecture. 
So without further ado, it's now 5 p.m. GMT, so feel free to get started when you're ready. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, as you said, my name is uh, Phaethon. Please feel free to call me Faye. That is not my real name. Um, so uh, today I'll be giving a uh, presentation on CETA to conservation um, in the Seychelles. Uh, this would also work as a uh, little career showcase of what I do. Um, my work is not only on sea turtle, but uh, the bulk of it is. Uh, so to start off, we'll we'll um, we'll. Um, and these islands are basically divided into two different groups. Uh, we have uh, the inner outer, uh, the inner I the inner islands, and the outer islands. Uh, the inner islands are basically categorized as being uh, granitic in nature, meaning they have uh, mountains and hills. Uh, while the outer islands, uh, they are coralline islands. So they are mostly flat and made up of sand. Uh, the islands that I have worked on. So I am from here. This is the, this is Mahe. This is basically the capital of the Seychelles. Uh, born and raised here. And when I started working in conservation, uh, the first island I worked on was up here in Al Reed. Uh, I spent I think six months to a year up here, and then I moved down to another island called Silhouette. And then I moved back to Mahe, where I spent the majority of my career um, uh, in conservation. And while working on Mahe, uh, I was with the Ministry of Environment, and I got a lot of opportunities to go around other islands. For example, Surf Island, which is right next door. Uh, Iloisif, this one over here, very tiny. Uh, Fregat Island, this one. Pale La Digue, also. Kiwi is uh, Setan. And now, currently, I'm no longer with the Ministry of Environment. I am up here on North Island. This is my current home for the time being. I've only recently started here. It's been, I think, four months. Um, it's a very small island, uh, 201 hectares. Uh, it has only four beaches. Um, so like I said, very tiny island. So in the Seychelles, uh, we only have two species of uh, sea turtles that nest um, on our beaches. So we have the hawksbill, uh, hawksbill turtle and the green turtle. So up here, this is the inner island group and all of this over here, this is the outer island group. Uh, within the uh, in the island, that's where we get uh, the majority of our um, hawksbills. Uh, we get more hawksbills than green turtles up here. Um, as you move down southwest towards Africa, uh, the number of green turtles increase drastically. Um, this is because historically there were um, very few people living on our island, so there are not there are no humans around to harm uh, these creatures. Um, North Island is actually very very special because we are probably the only, maybe silhouette also, but probably the only island that gets uh, both uh, green turtles and hawksbills in a very reasonable number. So the difference between uh, hawksbills and green turtles. Uh, the hawksbill actually gets its name from their hawk-like bill they have. It basically looks like a, a bird beak, um, while the green turtle has a very rounded head. Um, the hawksbill is considerably smaller than the green turtle. So the, big, the green turtle females are huge. Uh, the hawksbills are kind of small. Um, for the green for the hawksbills, uh, a, a very heavy one uh, would generally weigh up to two, uh, up to eighty uh, kilograms, while the green turtle uh, could weigh up to um, one hundred and forty kilos normally. Uh, there's also differences in the scutes, so the scales uh, for 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 hawksbills, they they tend to slightly overlap on top of each other. While for the green turtle, they basically slot in like puzzle pieces. 
sorry, I skipped one. So this is uh, this is our two our two species in in the flesh, the oxbill up here and the green turtle, um, Elitmochilis imbricata and Chenolia mides. The green turtle is so cute. I love the way it looks. So because of uh, their difference in size. Uh, the green turtles and the hawksbills uh, have very, very different tracks. Uh, for the greens, uh, because they're so heavy, they actually have to pull themselves up the beach uh, whenever they emerge. Uh, this uh, leaves behind uh, what I call the alternating footprints. While for the green, for the hawksbills, they're much lighter. They will basically walk up the beach, and so it will all alternate boop, 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 boop. Um, like I said the, the green turtles are much bigger uh, the tracks can sometimes be as as as, as large as uh, 120 centimeters and the largest uh, hawksbill track I've seen was I think exactly 100 centimeters or slightly above nothing nothing way more than that uh, for their nesting season our hawksbills um, they only come up during the day, and their season starts over in September and runs all the way to the following year and ends in March. After that, sometimes maybe we see one or two females still nesting in uh, April, May, but those are like late, late females. Um, but after that, we won't see any uh, won't see any hawksbills until the season starts up again. Uh, our green turtles they come up only during the night. Uh, they don't really have a nesting season. They will nest all year round. Um, but this is when we see them the most from January to September. And then it starts tapering off October, November, December. And the peak peak of our season is actually right now um, in May, uh, May, June. So uh, green turtles, as adults, they are strictly herbivores. They will only eat uh, seagrass and um, algae. This is actually how they got their names um, because of their diet. Uh, this actually discolors their fat um, to become green in color. So that's how they got their names. Not because of they look sort of green. They're actually not. They're kind of gray, grayish black when they're out of the water. Uh, the green you see is most likely just algae covering up, covering them. Um, for the hawksbills, they're omnivores. Uh, they could eat anything and everything. Uh, soft corals, hard corals, sea cucumber, crustaceans, and their favorite, favorite food is jellyfish, which is also a huge issue because they confuse plastic bags for jellyfish. Um, they they they, they won't be able to tell the difference. They'll eat a plastic bag, and that will usually result in in them dying. This is a video of one of our hawksbill um, juveniles feeding on the reef. Okay, so uh, nesting activities and hatchlings. Um, normally, for someone maybe that doesn't um, that doesn't uh, that isn't a part of 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 turtle conservation, and you don't have a, a a big understanding on how it works, you would probably think turtles come up the beach, dig a hole, nest, and then leave. Uh, which is actually not the case, far from it. They actually go through a host of different steps, different stages uh, before they before they even think about uh, going back to the water. So it's very simple. They start with uh, the emergence. This is them leaving the water and traveling up the beach to find a nesting spot. Uh, when they do uh, find a spot they kind of like, they start what we call uh, the uh, body pit process. Uh, this is basically going to be her um, displacing as much sand and other debris around her, and she'll sl slowly start lowering herself deeper and deeper into the sand. Sometimes we don't even see her. You might see a, a teeny bit of her back if you're walking by. So 
uh, after that, when, if she's happy with the body pit, um, that's when she goes ahead and starts what we call the egg chamber, which is basically just a chamber that's going to be holding the eggs. Uh, this is done with her just using her two black back flippers, uh, scooping sand up and out one at a time. Uh, this is can be very specific to some to each species. Some, um, uh, for example, green turtles can make their nests as deep as a as three feet, or even slightly more. While for uh, for hawksbills, they can probably make, they usually make their nests uh, a feet, uh, like a foot deep, not that deep. Um, so if she's happy with uh, the egg chamber, she starts the covering process. This is also done with only her two back flippers. She'll gently start covering the eggs. She'll actually pat pat down the, 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 the entrance of the nest making sure it's all compact and, and all nice. And then the big, big, big stage is called the camouflaging process. It's basically just her making as much as a mess as possible. She will absolutely devastate the area. She'll pile up the the nest with, I don't know, how, like five feet more sand on top, like just an absolute mess. Um, this is just to make sure that predators do not find her her eggs, basically. Uh, crabs will just be confused like crazy. Um, even us, sometimes we have no idea where the eggs are. Uh, these two images you see up here, this one is for the hawksbill. The nest is right around the corner of this rock. Uh, same thing applies for this one. This is for the green uh, the green turtle. The nest is over here. and. Uh, this is her going back down to the water. Uh, this nest, as you see here, this is for the hawksbill. These two are, are pictures of successful nest. This one is for the hawksbill. This one is for the green turtle. They're kind of the same, not really. Um, it's it doesn't always look like this, but this one are this two are, are I would say perfect. Um, if if you would in your mind right now, um, try and think where do you think these eggs are. Uh, to the untrained eye, where do you think these eggs are? If they're if they're here, if they're here, if they're here, uh, you can think about it now, and I'll now tell you exactly where the eggs are. And their eggs, her eggs for this one, are right in here. So this is where she f she finalized her body pit. This is the corner she stopped, and as you can see, this is her track doing a U turn, and going back down to the water. So she piled up. So hawksbills don't make that much of a mess as, as green turtles. So the eggs are right here. The road is right here. So this one, this is for the uh, green turtle. Uh, as you can see, much bigger, much messier. Um, her eggs, uh, this is the body pit. This is when she left. Her eggs are actually over, right over here. Um, I was there when she was nesting. I had to afterwards, after I think a week or two later, I had to remove those eggs and put them further up here because the waves were starting to get way too close and starting to wash over the nest. They're not always successful when they um, when they do come up. They run into s several issues sometimes. Uh, for example, if they're making the egg chamber, um, if she encounters too many uh, too many roots, too many rocks, uh, that could completely end uh, that that process. She will either abandon that spot and start over somewhere else, or she will just give up and leave. There are other issues. Uh, for example, we have different terms um, that we use. If if a turtle did not nest successfully and left, um, we have. Uh, Hunt half moon, which is basically her coming up halfway on the beach and without any, uh, without any intervention, um, just does a does a U turn and leaves. Uh, we have uh, wandering, which is uh, self explanatory. Uh, she will travel up to the very top of the beach and she'll just wander across the whole area without doing any attempt of trying to to nest and leave so that's called wandering and then we have the main one that we use which is called um esbo which stands for um immersion stopped by obstacles so this could uh this could mean anything uh, like being disturbed by humans 
being disturbed by other animals, um, being stopped by erosion, being stopped by rocks. For example, in this situation, she came up through here and got, got trapped in this corner and there was nowhere else to go. She couldn't go up. She couldn't go anywhere. So she's just like, Oop. she went back down. So, yep. Uh, these two here up here, this is, um, like I said, this is for our hawksbill. This is her laying her eggs. And this is our green turtle. Like I said, Hawksbill is only nest during the day. Uh, green turtle is only nest during the night. And this is a video of our one of our girls nesting. All right, um, for hawksbills, uh, each actually for both species, um, one female can nest multiple times within a season. Uh, for it's usually around uh, four to five times. Some some actually go even more than that. I think we got a female a couple of years ago that nested about eight, I think seven times, which is incredible. A uh, hawksbill. Uh, she can lay uh, a minimum of, I would say, 70, uh, 70 to 80 eggs and a maximum of, uh, a huge maximum of 250 eggs. Um, but for our green turtles, they do not lay that much, actually. Um, the lowest we got was around 50 eggs um, and the highest is normally around 150, maybe slightly more. Um, it takes two months uh, for these eggs to incubate. Not exactly two months. Um, for example, the hawk, uh, the green turtle will take 55 days, maybe slightly more. Sometimes it's overdue. But generally, two, two months is the incubation process. Uh, after two months, uh, um, under perfect conditions, we will see signs that uh, nesting is due to happen. Uh, for example, if you ignore these tracks here, all these little turtle tracks here, um, we you will sometimes see what we call a depression in the sand. Um, this occurs when the hatchlings uh, travel out of the egg chamber and work their way up to the surface. Uh, while they do this, the sand above them seeps down into the egg chamber. Also, I must say, um, when they do come up like that, uh, they leave all the, the eggs behind that they've, excuse me, um, that they hatch from. So they come up and they usually stay um, about five, uh, five centimeters beneath the sand. Uh, when they're there, when they're five centimeters uh, beneath the sand, um, they keep track of the temperature of the sand above them. So. Uh, once they reach that spot, if that sand is way too warm, they will not leave. They will stay there uh, and they'll just sleep, sleep away. As soon as they feel that sand starts getting cooler and cooler and cooler, that's when their brains go, up. Oh, time to go to school. They will wake up all at the same time, pop out of the sand and run straight to the water. And they, uh, they do go all at the same time. Um, because it's a it, it's basically a survival um, survival mechanic. Um, if you have so many baby tur so many of your your uh, so many of the same species, for example, schools of fish, um, normally it will confuse predators, or the likelihood of more than one um, maybe reaching the water is higher. For example, if if you have a situation where uh, only they're only going one by one. It's much easier for predators to pick them off. So this is the difference between our green turtles and hawksbill turtle babies. Up here, this is our green turtle babies. They're black at the top and white underneath. They have this 
uh, I would call this a, almost like a silver outline around their carapace and flippers. They're also slightly bigger, um, slightly bigger than their their uh, hawksbill counterparts, which are uniform brown. Here's a video of some hawksbills hatchling. Nice. And this one is our green turtle hatchlings. So going back to, unfortunately, we have to go back to geography. Um, here in the Seychelles, we uh, we do not have the traditional seasons like the majority of the rest of the world of the world have. We do not have summer, winter, spring, autumn. Uh, we are, instead we have uh, monsoons. Uh, we have the north uh, northwest monsoon, and then we have the southeast monsoon. Uh, for the northwest, um, this starts in November and runs all the way until April. And this is what we also call our rainy season. Uh, the southeast monsoon uh, starts in May and runs all the way to uh, October. And that is, uh, that's our dry season. And the monsoon actually affects um, the way our beaches look. For example, in April, this is West Beach. In April, at the northern end of West Beach, all the sand is um, packed at the at the very top, while um, when when it's towards October, all that sand from here gets shifted um, to the southern end. Um, the sand is in constant motion. Uh, it's never it's never fixed in one spot. Even if you're on the beach and you think it's not moving, it's actually moving every single day. So you might be asking yourself, how does this relate? to our total conservation work. And I would say it relates a lot, like heavily. Uh, sand movement is very, very damaging um, to our nest, to our turtle nest. Down here, these two images are actually um, about the same spot, but this picture was taken a little further down, um, down here. That's what I mean. Um, so as you can see how different it is all that sand just washed away and if there are any eggs nearby here that were not moved by us um, they will just get taken taken away uh, we monitor these changes very very closely um, if it happens uh, for example in, in this situation egg movement um, sand movements will uh, remove sand away from the nest, exposing the eggs and outright uh, outright killing the embryos inside, uh, making the eggs absolutely useless. If we if we do encounter these situations, as much as we can, um, we move those eggs. I will talk a little bit more about about that later. Uh, predation is a very natural process. It's it's not something we can prevent. Uh, crabs are their main predators um, as eggs and hatchlings. This is the ghost crab that we have here. Um, even from the day they're born, um, they're placed into the egg chamber. Those these crabs are already out looking for for the eggs, um, breaking them open and eating uh, eating the insides. Uh, even after they're hatchlings, as you can see, when they're running down the beach, they get they get chased around by these crabs and eventually taken back to the crab holes. 
Uh, we do have other predators in forms of uh, seabirds and shorebirds. This bird down here, this is called the frigate bird. This is uh, an, uh, another species that is uh, has been seen eating um, turtle hatchlings either straight off the sand or straight on the water when the when the babies are swimming away. And these babies, even after they reach the water, they're still not safe. They still have to worry about um, other predator fish uh, coming after them. So, um, approaching and educational work. I have to give a disclaimer for this part. Uh, for the next three slides, I will be talking about poaching. Um, so if anyone here is sensitive to very graphic material, I would say to just turn off the uh, presentation for now and just listen to my voice, and I will let you guys uh, know when to come back. The first the first two slides are not that bad, but the last one is a little, it's a little much. So um, humans have had absolutely devastating effects on our turtle friends. Um, poaching, uh, other than pollution, poaching is a huge problem in the world. It's especially a huge problem here in the Seychelles. Um, a lot of these turtles were, were uh, for example, for hawksbills, they were mainly killed for their shells. So they would take the, so they would take the scales and make jewelry out of it they'll make earrings they'll make sunglasses they'll make um hair combs etc uh down here this is uh this is a recipe for turtle clear turtle soup uh green turtles were mainly only killed for their meat for human consumption they were the the shells were used but not as much as for hawksbills hawksbill they didn't eat them um, because their flesh can be toxic if you don't know how to prepare it, but I've I've had cases where people still eat uh still poach and eat hawksbills. But the scales, like I said, were mainly only uh they were killed mainly only for the for the scales. Um construction on the beach obviously has a main uh is a has a major issue uh with limiting the amount of nesting areas for these animals. Um uh turtles do breathe, they do have lungs, they do breathe. So um, bycatch and lost fishing nets are a big problem also. If a turtle happens to get caught in a fishing net under the water and gets trapped there, um, it will eventually drown because they cannot come up uh, to breathe. Uh, like I said, hawksbills, they do make, they, they made jewelry out of it. There are still countries that sell these. Actually, during the time that I was making this presentation, I did not know that there used to be canned turtles. I, I don't know if there's anyone in here that knew about it, but I sure, I sure as hell didn't know about canned turtle soup. But these are obviously very, very old products. Uh, no one, uh, no one is allowed to touch turtles anymore. There are still countries still eating it, but like uh, produced, mass-produced um, turtle, um, turtle materials, I would say, are not allowed. This is a old um, ad, newspaper ad of uh, turtle, turtle soup. Uh, wildlife crime is a big, big part of uh, my my career. Uh, the this this is actually my hand. That's me over here. Uh, I've had to deal with mo like numerous cases of poaching um, here. Uh, up up here, what you see is what used to be a uh, male um, hawksbill turtle. Hawksbill turtle. I can tell you it's a male hawksbill because of the coloration of this of of the skin and the scales, and the tail here. So this um, generally for 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 a lot of reptiles, um, the males have long tails compared to the females. Uh, this was a case of the poacher running around, running away from policemen um, with this bag and then just tossing it into the bushes and getting away from the police. Afterwards, the police called us to come to the police station to check it out, just confirm that it's actually turtle meat, even if it's uh, obviously turtle meat, just for official reasons. Uh, down here, this is also Hawksbill. 
but this is when it's been dry, uh, it's been salted and dried. Another situation where I had to uh, go into people's homes and basically flip that house upside down. If there's a suspicion of uh, of illegal, you know, turtle poaching or having uh, turtle meat in someone's possession, it's my job to go to people's houses, search everywhere as much as possible, their fridge, under their bed, on their roofs, anywhere they can hide turtle meat. I am there looking for it. Um, in this instant, this instant, uh, the meat was in the freezer. In this picture, this is actually bits and pieces of green turtles. Um, this is actually from the plastron, which is the underneath of the turtle. And these were salted and being dried on top of the roof. So like I said, I have to check everywhere and make sure I catch these criminals. Okay, I'm done with the poaching part. If anyone left and came back. So conservation is a worldwide effort. Um, here in the Seychelles, we have something called the Turtle uh, Sea Turtle Festival, which also happens at the same time as World Sea Turtle Day. Uh, alongside, well, it actually starts on um, biodiversity, biodiversity Day all the way until Sea Turtle Day, which is around in June. Um, and this is basically us doing as we do educational work every day, but on that specific day, it's uh, it's 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 more aimed towards kids, um, towards schools, um, and also people in the public, but it's made special for kids so that they grow up advocating for turtle conservation and not um, growing up eating turtles and agreeing with that practice. Here are some more pictures of uh, us during uh, the turtle uh, festival. Uh, we basically set up around the popular areas in town, um, just bring as much displays as possible. Anyone in the, anyone that passing by can just stop, ask some questions, and hopefully leave uh, with more knowledge and understanding about the protection of sea turtles in, in the Seychelles and in the world in general. Up here, uh, we also have these signs. Uh, this is uh, this is basically signs that we place around um, nesting sites for turtles because we get a lot of people both local um, and tourists uh, come to the Seychelles wanting to see turtles, but it's um, it's very important that they 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 follow a few rules when when viewing turtles. I will uh, explain that further into the presentation. But this sign, we place these signs around the popular nesting sites, and anyone that doesn't really know anything about turtles or how to act around turtles, uh, they can just refer to this, and uh, hopefully. Okay. So our turtle program. So our program was uh, our research program was standardized in 2004. Um, this is where the island was um, separated into divided into seven um, seven sections. Uh, West Beach, which is this one, has been was separated into two A and B. Pichitas, it's uh, it's small enough. We don't really have to separate it. Uh, West Beach, which is our largest beach, is separated for this one small here is normally closed off uh, depending on the time of the year. Uh, sometimes there's sand here we can just walk across. Sometimes there's no sand and it's just rocks and we have to hike around. It's a very small beach. We call it Honeymoon, Honeymoon Beach. So this is, um, like I said, since 2004 until today, we've been uh, keeping track of our uh nesting uh nesting females on the island and as you can see it's been going very very well we've been having a lot of uh, a lot of turtles coming to our new turtles coming to our island to nest um the red line you see here is our is for the greens uh the green one is for the hawksbills um you might notice that the for the green turtle there is a zigzag pattern that is because um uh, net, uh, female greens will actually uh, rest in between seasons. So they'll spend one year um, nesting. The following year, she will not show up to nest. She will um, just relax, have a nice time, um, restore her fat, her body fat, and then come and nest the next following year. 
And in 2008, uh, 2018, that was our big, big green turtle year. We had uh, 200, uh, 618 emergencies. Um, and then it, go, it went back down again uh, in 2019. Uh, this was, uh, I believe, 300 and, 327. And then it went up a little bit around four, in the 400s in 2020. And now current season, we're expecting it to go a little low which is normal like i said uh for the green turtles they they haven't had a a drastic increase compared to uh the green turtles but they're still doing very well as you can see so whenever we do um whenever we do find um turtle activity or if we know there's a nest we leave behind these coconuts this is how we mark our nest um usually the eggs, if we're 100% sure, the eggs are right uh, right over here behind the coconut, usually. So, for example, the, my colleague here is digging a nest right over there. So, on these coconuts, as you can see, we just put our general information on it. Uh, which species it is, um, which, uh, nest, uh, which nest number it is. So, this one was uh, nest number 90. So, each, each season, this... Um, this number restarts to zero. So this was the 90th nest that we have. For, this was actually this year. This was in March. Um, this was our 90th um, nest. For this one, this was a green turtle, and this was our 54th uh, nest. And this date is the exact um, exact, exact uh, date the eggs were laid. So now we can keep track of that two-month incuba um, incubation period and come back when we should expect um hatchlings if we if we do get um if we do have an issue um with um erosion this is where uh nest translocation comes in uh like i remember like i said before uh, the sand movements um if we if we're keeping track of uh sand movements and we find that it's necessary to move these eggs we do so um, and it depends on it depends on how old the eggs are, how far into the incubation period they are. For example, if it's if it's um if it's a very old nest, if it's past twenty four hours and maybe forty eight hours, um, the longer the longer the nest has been in one spot, the the harder it is to translocate because the eggs become very, very delicate. So this is when we have to come in with a marker and before we remove the eggs, we just do a little dot on top at the very top. Uh, this is to make sure that we do not rotate um, the eggs when we're moving them to a new, a, new, uh, a new nest. If we rotate, that will destroy the embryo and kill the baby inside. Uh, if we do do a translocation, we add more information to the coconut uh, at the back, and uh, this gives us an opportunity to know exactly how many how many eggs there are. Uh, for example, this one had uh, 195 eggs, and like I said, this can get very very complicated very quickly because it's not easy sometimes. Um, if we did not see her laying. Um, it can be like trying to find a needle in a in a haystack. Sometimes it's very easy, but for this picture up here, it just took me about I think two to three hours to find the eggs because I was digging here mostly. Um, and we also have the issue of why you're trying to dig for trying to dig down. You have more sand collapsing, falling back into the hole that you are digging in. And sometimes these uh, these nests for for example for uh, green turtles. They can be very, very deep. They could be about three feet, four feet down into the sand. Uh, you can use, we can use egg trays. I would personally use, uh, only use egg trays if it's a very, a very fresh uh, nest. So if it's on the same day, uh, I have no problem using egg trays, but it's, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, like I said, the orientation of the eggs don't matter. The placement um, don't matter. Uh, but uh, when we go into when we go into uh, uh, further into the incubation period, that's when it gets more complicated. Like I said, and we have to use buckets instead because we we keep the same we put the eggs back on the same level that they were. So the bottom eggs always go back to the bottom, and the top eggs always stay at the top. Um, after the two months incub uh, incubation, if we 
um, if we know the eggs, uh, the hatchlings are about to leave, and we have people with us, I make what what I like to call the turtle highway or the uh, the turtle um, uh, red carpet. Uh, this helps us immensely uh, because one, uh, it helps protect them against predators. If there's any crabs nearby, uh, this will practically protect them from 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 crabs. Um, they also, this also helps them against uh, getting trapped in people's footprints. If we have tourists with us and people obviously get very excited, they're walking back and forth. They're walking in front of where the turtle is going down the beach. And if the sand is very deep, she can fall into, the, to the, into people's footprints and get trapped there until a crab decides to want, that it wants to eat it. Tagging. Tagging is, um, is another major part of our work. Whenever we see a turtle, um, it gives us a lot of opportunity to uh, collect more information, to collect more data. For example, measuring the carapace um, to keep track of growth, um, tagging both flippers. I, I want to say this is actually a very old um, old photo, uh, a couple of years ago. And, and I feel like these two tags predicted predicted coronavirus because 2020 and 2021 <laughs> i just want to point that out so we do put tags on both sides of the flippers usually we do this um, while she's laying um, when she, she when she's in the process of laying eggs um, her mind her, her brain is a hundred percent focused on only laying those eggs so it's during that time it gives us an opportunity to come in, collect our data, tag if necessary, and leave. Um, because it won't it won't disturb us. She won't even know that we're there usually. If not, we can still do it when the turtle is going back down. It it is a bit invasive. It is a bit disruptive. Uh, but it's 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 not that bad. It's not it's not gonna cause them to leave forever. Often enough, um, we tag them. Uh, when they're going back to the water, and they still come back for their next uh, for their next nest, so it's it's not too bad. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, there are other ways of collect to to identify individuals other than tagging. Uh, there are um, organizations that choose to do um, face IDs, which is basically taking pictures of both sides of the turtle's face and. Um, putting that into a database where you can go back if you ever see a turtle again, refer to the images and just look at the placement of the scales on the head. The 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 the, the tags are, uh, to me, in my opinion, are much more reliable uh, because it helps everyone. Everyone that's uh, um, a part of turtle conservation can can benefit from uh, the tags. For example, if it's if it's someone doing doing only the face IDs, other groups won't be able to 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 determine and find out individual turtles because maybe they don't do uh, face IDs. But the but the but the tags they're all unique. They all get unique codes, and this helps us uh, know exactly uh, when she was tagged where she was tagged how frequently she's um, how frequently she's nesting and how long did how long she le she lived for so maybe sometimes uh, we'll keep track on of, of different so there's no gps by the way there's no gps there are gps tags that people put on the back of turtles um this one is just a aluminium um earring i guess i can call it it does not um it does not do anything other than having the the code on it and it helps us uh, know exactly how long they live for. So if we don't see a, a female for a very long time, we can assume that she is no longer alive. So if you're ever on the beach, if you're ever in a country where you expect to see uh, uh, sea turtles and you're walking on a beach and you see only one track, more often than not, there is a turtle nearby. Um, if you see, if you're walking on a beach and you see two tracks like this, uh, that means she's already came and left. So what do you do if there is a turtle on the beach? Uh, we have what we call the safe viewing zone, which is basically her blind spot. Um, 
as much as possible, you don't want her to see you. Um, turtles are extremely shy animals. They're absolutely terrified of people. And if she does see you, if she's she if he if she just left the water and traveling up the beach, and you happen to be there and she sees you, she'll just do, uh, no thank you. I'm going back into the water. But if uh, if you're if not, if you manage to probably maybe I would say sit down and not move, she might just think you're a rock and just walk past you. Uh, but if she's going uh, back to the water. This is where if you really, really want to get a video of her going back to the water or you want some really good pictures, just try to stay within that safe viewing zone. Um, she can very easily just lift her head and look behind her, uh, but maybe it won't happen. Maybe it won't, but usually th this is okay. If you're keeping at least 10 to 15 meters away from her and you're sitting down, uh, it shouldn't be an issue for her. So this is an example of uh, a good, uh, okay area of viewing, and this is not. So um, these people are not in a good spot. So I would prefer them to be up here with the rest of the group. Um, this puts unnecessary stress on our turtles, which is something we do not want. She's already very, very tired, and you're, got, and you're here with your phone, absolutely scaring the crap out of her. <laughs> This is a video of our one of our hawksbills. This was on uh, West Beach at the end of West Beach, uh, going she was going back down to the water. Okay, during the night, um, at night it's also very very important. Uh, I'll start off with the, uh, our hatchlings. If you're on the beach as much as possible, do not use any form of artificial lights. So flashlights, uh, flash photography is a big no no. Why? Because um, hatchlings are very very attracted to light um, how they know which way the water is is um, them uh, looking at the reflection of the moon or reflection of of stars on the surface of the water so that's what they use to uh, go to the ocean if you have a bright light behind them they will prioritize the brightest light and that's when we have issues with if you're having a flashlight they will just do turn around and come running straight towards you, just stampeding straight towards you. This is also a big issue also for nests that are close to roads. Um, if you have, if there's street lights or there's a house nearby, um, they're up to go towards the road or towards the house. And that's where you have um, issues with um, turtles getting crushed um, by cars or eaten by your pet or etc. cetera. Uh, for green turtles, they're absolutely scared of lights, terrified. If you even remotely flash a, flash a light in their eyes, they'll freak out and just leave. They'll be like, no thanks, I'm gonna, I'm done for today. And uh, like I said, footprints are also a big issue for, for hatchlings. Uh, 
don't walk in front of them. <laughs> and with that, I would like to say thank you very much, everyone, for joining my presentation. Hey, thank you. Um, so I do have a list of questions. Uh, if Luna just wants to tag me in them, I'm, there's been a couple throughout the um, the talk. I don't know if you were looking at the lectures and conferences. I was not. I can see it now, though. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of activity. Okay, so I'm just going to yeah. pick one at random. So the first question I have is: um, Are the sexes determined the same as that as crocodiles? So the hotter gives female, the cooler gives males. Um, yes. So what Yes, absolutely. Um, if the nest is very warm, they do turn out to be, uh, the majority of them do turn out to be females. If it's a cooler nest, they are males, yes. Interesting. So that's probably something to do with climate change that is a, a worry, right? If you start by... Yeah, climate change and also if, um, if we have uh, large amounts of rain falling on top of the nest, if the, if the, the waves are being too high or the, the nest is way too low, um, sometimes you have just a little bit of, uh, of water washing over the nest and that will, that will, um, alter the temperature of the nest. Oh, interesting. Okay. So another question is what is the frequency of successful egg hatching? Uh, so it depends on, uh, which species and the location of the nest. Uh, for example, we have some areas where um where we have a crazy amount of of, of crab activities uh, for example there's one spot on east on west beach which is absolutely nuts and we we try our best to remove every single nest that is placed in our air in that area because as soon as a nest um as soon as some eggs are placed in that spot crabs by the hundreds just dig in and eat those eggs uh, we do get so we do do what we call a nest succession survey whenever uh, whenever we know um, hatchlings have come up and left. So this is us kind of just basically digging up all the eggs out and counting all the ones that have hatched, um, all the all of the ones that were infertile, all the, all of them all of the ones that were predated. So it does vary depending species to species and exactly which spot of uh, which spot of which area the eggs were placed in. Um, like I said earlier, if there's a lot of rain, uh, so much rain can actually kill the eggs entirely, stopping uh, the the nest will be way too cold uh, to incubate and they'll just rot away. So sometimes we do get nests that are like uh, zero um, zero survival. But usually, I would say if I have to give you um, an average, per, uh, uh, let's say out of a out of a hundred eggs, we normally get uh, eighty to ninety ones that were successful, and the rest are either infertile or predated. Quite good. That's better than I was thinking. Um, okay. So next question: Which one of these two turtles uh, is more populated, or is more of them in number? So like I said, uh, for the green turtle, they're critically endangered. Uh, for the hawksbills, they're just endangered, so not as bad um, as uh, green turtles. Meaning on a global scale, there's much more um, hawksbills than there are green turtles. But for our island specifically, we have more uh, we have more green turtles than we have hawksbills. Um, okay, so here's another question. So with poaching, how do you actually find out? Um, does somebody come in with a tip or do you actively go on patrols? So both, actually. Sometimes well, it's a tip and sometimes it's um, patrols. So for example, um, if we're up on, the, if I'm doing patrols on the beach um, and I'm walking on the beach and, and I find that there's only one track going up, Sometimes, like I said, you would think there's one turtle, uh, but actually uh, you go and you check and there's no turtle at all. And someone has just taken a, taken the whole turtle, tossed it into a pickup or a car and drove off with it. Um, and from there, we can just start our investigation work, check cameras around the location, check license plates, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, another question so is... Effective work. 
Yes, detective work. So the way that you put the coconuts above the nests, um, someone asked the question, does this actually help poachers as well as sort of help people stay away from them? So for our island, we do not have any poaching. Um, it will definitely help poachers on other islands, but for our island specifically, we do not have any um, any poachers here. It's a very, like I said, it's a very tiny island. North Island is actually a, a luxury resort. So we have about only 100 staff here. And only my team, um, uh, the environment team, and tourists are allowed to go onto beaches. Anyone else, for example, maybe someone from maintenance or hospitality or whatever, they are not allowed to go to any of these beaches without special permission. So it will not help anyone other than us <laughs> in our That's... island specifically. Yeah, okay. So I can see that, how that might be different for other islands as well. Yes, on Mahi, mm -hmm. definitely don't want to do this because that would just, uh, you're just asking for it at that point. It's a signal. Come here. Um, okay, so another question. So does tagging the turtles like that, does it hurt them at all? So um, I would say during, uh, during the time she is nesting, like I said, her brain is 100% focused on, um, on only laying her eggs. Uh, I've had had sometimes she does give me a reaction. Uh, she might give a little twitch, a little jolt. Um, there are some females that I would tag, I would tag them and they won't even even slightly move nothing like they didn't even feel it uh, but yes it 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 does hurt a bit but like i said it's only a one-time thing it happens once in their life and it, <laughs> they're good to go <laughs> cool so, so that's next... why i prefer to tag uh during nesting rather than when they're leaving uh leaving the beach yeah makes sense makes sense so here's another question. Um, so I know that there are tortoises with parasites like ticks. Do you check for parasites or remove ticks from your turtles? Um, I wouldn't say ticks of any kind, but there we do get some girls with a lot of barnacle. Um, usually, I I wouldn't I wouldn't do any. It doesn't really harm them in any way. Um, you might you might be the one causing them harm if you're trying to remove barnacles off of them. So no, I I do not. So you just leave them, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't really do anything to them. Okay, good. So this is uh, one of the last questions uh, that I've got on my list. Um, I think this was in context of sort of staying out of their eyesight and staying out of their um, viewpoint. You you mentioned to stand in that blind spot. Um, how how good is their eyesight? Do they have sharp eyesight, or are they you know? On land, not terrible, blind as hell. Normally, <laughs> they only know that they mostly notice movement. Like I said, if you're sitting down, not moving, about five ten meters away, she'll just think you're a rock or like a log or whatever. She won't even notice. But if you're moving around, if you're acting all excited, walking towards her, she will definitely notice that and she'll leave. Okay, so I'll take one more question. Some people have asked some questions since I've been asking them. So the last question is, so in terms of transferring them, after you've collected the eggs, what happens then? Do you immediately put them or is there sort of a protocol there? So uh, after we've collected the eggs? So yeah, we, uh, as, so, so, so usually this is a team of um, minimum two people or three people. Um, if I'm the one digging uh, digging the nest out, as I'm digging for the eggs, someone is already preparing uh, a new nest not too far away in a safer location. So as soon as we find the eggs, uh, we move them, uh, take measurements of that uh, of that chamber. We go ahead and move them straight into the new nest as fast as possible, so they don't stay up um, out of uh, out of the sand for too long. That's good. Um, okay, so that's the last question I'll ask you by voice. Um, feel free um, after we're done to answer, you know, by typing in the lectures and conferences channel. There's many people mm -hmm. awaiting you there. I just want to yeah. say thank you so much again for giving us the talk. It was absolutely amazing, super interesting. Um, so if, if that's all to do, we can say goodbye and we can continue chatting in the lectures and conferences channel. Yes, thank you so much for coming. There's so many of you, goodness me. Yeah, we hit 30 people in the 
record and I'm not sure how many were watching, but I know people were watching it in the YouTube. 30 in the YouTube, so 60 in total. I'm I'm happy you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for for reaching out. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys in in the the text channel. Bye-bye. Bye.